Hello and welcome to The Progress Theory, where we discuss scientific principles for optimising human performance. I am Dr Phil Price and on today's episode we are joined by powerlifter and SNC coach Rob Palmer. Now I've known Rob for many, many years and I know he knows a thing or two about getting as strong as possible. He's won many national titles and international titles in powerlifting and was an SNC coach in professional rugby for over 15 years. So I wanted to know a bit more around his processes on getting as strong as possible and see if we can use that to improve our bench press. As always, follow The Progress Theory on Instagram, YouTube and check out all of our other episodes. Here is Rob Palmer. Rob, thank you, thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Phil. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I've been looking for this. Obviously, we've known each other for years, um, but uh, I've, especially in recent times, like, so, okay, I'll start this off with the, in the St. Mary's gym, there have certain records, powerlifting records, and your one is up there. And I remember people telling me that you spent six years going from... 200 kilos to 201 kilos hopefully i'm right but it just showed how impressive that lift is and also just how much work you have to do to actually move to that next step especially when you're kind of at that elite level people just think that you just like improvements in strength just like are linear when they're not like they are really quite difficult when you're near the top end of the sport so uh i've always been interested to ask you that particular question like (laughs) <laughs> how was it you know training for so long for a really impressive improvement but to like a like a casual person that might seem like a really small improvement yeah I, I suppose when I yeah when I look back on all that stuff the first couple of years of training are brilliant aren't they you make progress every week you go in you make progress you you make big jumps in your whatever lift it is so that was bench press but you make big um you make big jumps in those lifts quite quickly and then you do hit mm. that kind of there is going to be a sort of genetic ceiling, isn't there, to what you can, how much force you can produce with your sort of optimised technique. So you've optimised your technique, Mm. you've gained as much sort of muscle mass as you can functionally, and then you try and give it as much signal as possible to do its job. Um, And and then you hit that ceiling pretty quickly. And then after that, it's, it's a it's very frustrating. Um, so yeah, it probably was about six years, and that's just a gym lift. Obviously, I've never done because um, uh, I would lift equipped, so there would be a lot more, um, mm-hmm. a few more variables there, and how you push that total up, and doesn't necessarily mean that you have to get stronger with the equipment. Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to maximise the equipment. So there's a slightly different way that you can keep sane as you go through the process. Um, but yeah, the uh, that I, I think. Yes, it's frustrating, but not as frustrating if you love the process as opposed to the outcome. The outcome's great. Like you, everyone likes saying, yeah, I've got a PB, I'm, you know, but no one really cares. If you're benching 200 kilos, 201 kilos, you, you're, in a, you're in a sort of the 200 <laughs> kilo club. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah. yeah, you don't, uh, you, you have to love the process. And if you love the process, you'll, you'll, you'll just love going through the sort of what some people would perceive as being monotony. You, you love the monotony because you're thinking, right, how can I tweak this variable, change that, do this special exercise that gives me a little bit more, like hyper-analyze such a, such a well, I say basic. It's, it's basic if you look at it superficially, isn't it? The bench press. But if you actually go into the detail of it, it's really quite uh, complicated. Well, before we learn a bit more about your process, do you want to tell the viewers just a little bit more about yourself? I left university, got a job at um, London Irish, the rugby club, as a strength and conditioning intern and went through a full process of, you know, getting employed, um, running the academy, becoming like a rehab strength and conditioning coach, then becoming the head strength and conditioning coach at the club, which I held, a position I held for 10 years until uh, um, until the administration process. Um, and then that's sort of, more, sort of my professional life. So I haven't, you know, I had one job. I left university, got one job and stayed in that job until they basically kicked me out the door, <laughs> um, which is, uh, which is very sad, but, um, but hopefully it's going to lead to better things, uh, you know, in, in the future, hopefully, because I've got mm. a lot of experience now. 
and yeah. then uh, from huge the, amount of experience. Yeah, like uh, there's yeah. S and C coaches in the UK that would, you know, do anything to try and get that type of experience that you've had. You've been the head S and C coach for one of the top rugby teams uh, for over a decade. Uh, yeah, huge. and it's been yeah, it was amazing. Um, you know, and, and I've been very lucky because you, you know, I think I think people think that sport is, you know, and obviously I've seen two sides of it now. I've seen the sort of ruthless side where you can just lose your job because, you know, professional sport isn't financially the most viable hobby for an owner to have. Um, so you, there is always that risk, I guess, that, that someone may walk away and you could lose your job. On the flip side of that, I've been so privileged to work with very caring people who care about you as a person, not just the team and the results. They care about you as a person and try and get try and get the very best out of you and help you develop. So I made loads of mistakes along the way, like loads, loads of absolute howlers. Um, and when you look back on it, you're like, oh my God, what were you thinking? Like, uh, but that's obviously the benefit of hindsight. And when you learn, you learn from those mistakes, you reflect back on them like, I don't know, eight, seven, eight years later, and you're like, why did I, what was I thinking? But the job in professional sport, you're challenged to make lots and lots and lots of decisions every single day that you know, realistically could have a negative, a very negative outcome for the, for the player, they get injured or, you know, you get, there's so many things that you have to consider in, in the job from an organization, organizational standpoint. And, uh, it, yeah. And you just have to be very lucky. You have to be, I was lucky and not many people are as lucky as me. I don't think to have people around them that want them to develop as well. And they take the rough with the smooth. They know that you have and I'd say my biggest strength in doing the job was that I showed the, you know, the coaches and the, and the players, I actually genuinely cared about them and the team. And, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't like a, a, a vehicle for me to progress personally. What was the culture like? Because I remember seeing London Irish's gym because I came down to one of your seminars. You did a powerlifting seminar there and obviously at St Mary's we've had a number of uh, students go down and do work placements there and they quite often say of how good the lifting culture was at London Irish there was a good SNC pe people understood its role within sport within rugby uh, and because of that the players were very engaging with the with the coaches themselves so I wanted to know a bit more firsthand about what you thought the culture was like at London Irish so this is me probably being a little bit controversial. I still think people don't value strength training as much as they should because it, things come in and out of vogue, don't they? So when I first came to the sport, strength training was massive in terms of the, the, the thought process of what strength training can, can do for you. And I'm talking about like basic strength training, getting good at deadlifting, getting good at squatting, getting good at being able to bench press, overhead press, as, as much weight as possible. Um... You, you had this kind of culture. So it came from, so my first boss was Alan Ryan, who worked at Wasps uh, before London Irish. And he worked under Craig White for a while. And Craig would have gone to America. So this is all the, you know, the sort of journey of strength training through the years. So at that point in time, so I started in 2007, Alan would have been at Wasps for uh, four, four years before that, say. Um, but that's like the early 2000s then. During that time, Westside Barbell is like the, you know, if you looked online or did any kind of research, you'd the be like, pinnacle. Well, the pinnacle of strength training is Westside Barbell. So Craig had gone out to Westside Barbell and he'd done an, a, you know, an internship with uh, Louis Simmons there. And that obviously filters back into the rugby. So then they were, we were following more of like um, a classic kind of, almost like a classic Westside style of, of training with some adaptations for field sports. And um, everyone was really invested in it. Then you go through this sort of cycle of, you know, it becomes less popular it becomes less fashionable and you get the, it's sort of gone, it's swung all the other way where people are doing these kind of really highly um, uh, coordination, strength training type exercises. And I think you're missing the point of what the role of strength is in athletic performance. And obviously I have my biases because my sport was, you know, so I would have lifted in powerlifting before I became a, professional strength and conditioning coach so I had my biases around what I thought it could do I obviously had some insight into how to uh, achieve the right kind of techniques to maximize the uh, force outputs um, but yeah I, I 
I think the culture, going back to the culture part, the, the, the players just saw the value in it. They saw the value in getting stronger. And, and it's like the proof's in the pudding. Did they, did they get, by getting stronger, especially when we got to the back end and we got more, um, we had more access to sports science kind of technology. So we had force plates and other bits and pieces like that. But when you've got the force plates and you see, right, if we take your strength from this to this and you jump higher on the force and you produce more force, then you've got your buy-in straight away. But also the, the, the players seeing, you know, they, all they want to know is that it's going to transfer to the game. So on the field, it's going to transfer. What they do in the gym is going to transfer on the field. And the majority of them always felt that it did. I'd say this is the, the one case. So the ones I think don't, <laughs> the players that I think don't think strength training transfers aren't conditioned enough to cope with the demand of, so you look at the training schedule, it's not like a weight session, then go home and you're done for the day. Like m- m- most people train that way, don't they? Most, most you know, I, I train that way for a sport, but there's field sports are different in that you have to do a technical tactical session either in the morning or the afternoon and you have to find a slot to do weight training, which is developmental as well either side of that. And you do that most days, most training days that, that you're in. Um, so if, if you're not highly conditioned, as in your aerobic system isn't developed well enough, and you're sort of, you know, you've always, you've always sort of ticked boxes, then you'll never be able to cope with the demand of actually pushing two things at the same time. So you're trying to develop strength and power. You're trying to develop some sort of... Um, so, uh, metabolic pathways as well. So like your sort of aerobic system, anaerobic system, alactic system, they're, they're obviously getting touched up in the training sessions as well. So you're, you're, you're getting hit from lots of different angles. And if you're not actually in a, if your base level of fitness isn't high enough, you won't be able to cope with it. Yeah, certainly. No, I completely agree. And we had our previous season of the progress theory was all about the development of strength and uh, endurance at the same time, um, which was, you know, developed within, I guess, because you've got rugby is like a concurrent sport. You need to be strong. You need to be yeah. a good aerobically fit. Um, so it's very much like concurrent training helps with that. And then if, I think through that, we've developed this hybrid training where it's like, okay, if we put two different sports together, let's say someone's a power lifter, but they're also training to do a, a triathlon, mm. uh, then it's slightly different. But it just means the training itself is different. You just have to manage the demands of the fatigue that you get from the different sports, mm-hmm. from strength and endurance, slightly differently than you would if you're doing a doing it in a team sport because the end goal is to be as good as rugby as possible. It's not necessarily to <laughs> hit a certain time or yeah. hit a certain lift in powerlifting. So that was always really, really interesting. And it's interesting that you say that if you don't have that kind of aerobic endurance base within you, then you are less conditioned and then that doesn't enable you to either, I guess it's recover, isn't it? Yeah, Between recovery, repeated yeah. bouts of force expression yeah. in yeah. rugby. It's all about the recovery. It's got nothing to do with, because the guys who are obviously aerobically really, really well developed, they're not particularly strong, but they can come in and hit, you know, 80% plus, 90% plus. It doesn't seem to affect them the same way that it does the guys who are less fit. Now, if you take them out of that um, context, say they get injured and they come out, the guys who are less aerobically developed, as soon as they start the weight training, and obviously this is a bit of mm. what you're born with, isn't it? So mm-hmm. if you're born with these sort of uh, uh, you know, predisposition to be exposed, you've got more type 2, type 2X, predominantly from a genetic standpoint versus the sort of aerobic stuff. And then there's obviously a bit of nature nurture there as you go through the process of what, what, what gets sort of turned on and what gets turned off. Um, but as a general rule, the guys who are less fit, when they start doing the weights, then they, the weights just go, they skyrocket. And, uh, but it's a false economy because as soon as you go back into the process, you're still not, you still not got that sort of base level to then uh, maintain what you, what you built there. And it takes, mm-hmm. it nosedives a little bit as they come back into the program. What have you really taken from your time at London Irish and training rugby players? What have you taken from that that's helped you really well with your powerlifting programming? I think the holistic aspect of training an athlete. So if I was to, yeah, if I was to look at all the stuff that we did, so the full performance program, you look at all the, the sort of specialists we have or have access to on a daily basis. So you'd have, um, from the S&C side, you've got four or five other S&C coaches with different areas of special, uh, different areas of expertise, as in nuances, 
um, and also diff- different. Um, some have vastly different interests in terms of what they enjoy as a sport. So that, like, like we said earlier, with your own biases, <clears throat> that influences influences your thinking, and then leads to much sort of richer conversations about how you make an athlete better generally. Um, but on top of that, that's just the S&C team. Then you've got your sports science department. So them guys look at all the data, heavy stuff, and you can learn so much from them about how to, you know, you know, sort of building of databases, how you, how you sort of mine for information that you're after. Um, and then we got to the point with our sports scientist, Ben uh, Cousins, um, you know, he was looking into sort of machine learning models and things like that to use within the the, the rugby environment and all the data that we have coming in. Um, then you have the medical team, so you have a, a, a access to doctors, really experienced physiotherapists, massage therapists. It's just such a, it's such a brilliant. If you're willing, if you're if you're open, if you're open to it, all the information coming in, you can learn so much um, from all these people who have all different areas of expertise, different backgrounds, different experiences, and you've got access to them all the time. You go to work, you work with them all the time, and then you're you then collectively solve these problems. So you, you, you collectively solve a problem of X athlete can't do whatever thing and then, or they're injured or, and then you collectively solve those problems. Um, and it's, uh, that, so yeah, my, my, my biggest learnings from rugby are, are more that kind of truly holistic kind of programming where you have to consider, you have an appreciation and consider all the facets of what make an athlete good now, again, <laughs> I say that. I always go back to my biases all the time. Of, of like, well, what's going to make them better? Well, I think if they got a bit stronger, then, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, it's good self-awareness, yeah, that, isn't it? Yeah, incredible, yeah. Um, I'm biased, but I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm aware. I'm the boss. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, like that, that just that, that, that experience of all that was, was amazing. And then, like you said, to, to have the ability to do it for the number of years that I did it. Because you say, I, I ended up being like a, a bit of a constant. I was always there, but the people around me all changed. So I've had, had access to lots and lots of uh, different people, which has been amazing. I completely agree. And I've spoken to a number of people within S&C and a lot, of they, a lot that they talk about is the process hmm. rather than the end goal. They talk about enjoying the process. And as people become more aware of people's different expertise, uh, how different areas can actually contribute to that process. I think people are becoming more and more open uh, and it's leading to new ways of doing things. And I think it's really exciting. Um, I think people are getting better at knowing what to absorb and what to discard. That's not to say that information from certain departments or anything like that, or certain information that you're receiving is not necessarily useless, but it might not be relevant at that particular point. And I think that's a a skill as well, because if you're trying to enhance the process, if you just try and put everything in, you're not you're going to be quite poor at developing everything at the same time. So it's all about just trying to understand what the athlete needs at that particular time, which is going to help develop that process and be that constant as they start to develop in whatever whatever physical qualities they may need for that particular sport. Um, so yeah, I'm, it's because what you said earlier regarding your 201 deadlift and why... Uh, and ben, why bench press, not deadlift. That, <laughs> bench press, bench press, sorry. No, don't, yeah. don't shoot me down like I'm thinking that. of myself there. <laughs> oh, oh, don't yeah, say that. Yeah just how the whole thing was enjoying that process leading to that one kilo increase and so people become better at trying to understand what is necessarily to add into their own particular processes because the end goal is important but it's hard to achieve if you don't have the right processes involved Mm. so it's always interesting to see like you know you have your process everyone has their own process and it's usually derived from uh, what they've read or all the experiences that they have so it's always interesting to see you know where people's processes come from because by asking that question you you start to learn about their experiences yeah so i suppose you, you talk about all the factors that go into adding a kilo to a to one lift in training, not in competition, mm. in training. So yeah. what goes into it? You, first, you've got to be, stay healthy enough, haven't you? So you're, you're always flirting with this, this line of, well, how much is too much? And if I do too much, 
if I get hurt in the process. And not necessarily hurt as in an, a really acute kind of pathology that means that you're out of training completely, but then kind of like the things that niggle in the background that stop you being able to, because all, all, all of it comes down to expression of force, isn't it? So that stop you being able to express force in the way that you want to um, and interrupt training. So whether that some sort of slight awareness in your shoulder or pec or tricep, elbow, wrist, you know, uh, issues where you obviously with the, with the technique, um, lower back issues, hip cramp, because you're in this kind of like really arched, um, high, high, uh, overly extended position. Um, you know, if you can eliminate all of those, then you have a good chance. The, the, obviously the, the program, I, I think about this quite a lot programs, actually the exercises, selection of exercise, all that kind of stuff is obviously incredibly important, but there's probably lots of ways to skin the cat in that area. Because you're applying the, you think of it, you go strip it all the way back to like your kind of like gas model of thinking. It's like, are you applying a stimulus? And is that stimulus great enough to elicit some sort of adaptation as you come back in, come back up? And obviously the specific nature of it, if you're doing bench press, you're doing other variations of bench press, you probably will Mm. get better at bench press. Um, Mm. And then the environment is massively important as well. So you would know both times. So when I've hit, I think, how many? So I think every single time I've benched 200 kilos, uh, Ben has been there. <laughs> and I've only just realized that now when we're talking yeah. about it because I, <laughs> I, I try not to think about him too much. Um, but every single time Ben has been there, and you know what, what he's like. Like he is, yeah. he's just full of energy and enthusiasm and, and it, you know, the kind, you need people around you who make you think that you can do it. And mm. he's one of those type of people. He's full of like po- yes, positive energy. And, um, and I wouldn't be big on that kind of thing, but it's only now we've spoken about it. I'm like, oh, he was there. Oh, maybe I need him to come <laughs> to my house more often. <laughs> yeah. For those that don't know, Ben or Ben Lonergan, uh, he was on the Progress Theory back in season three. So definitely check him out. He is now the head of performance at Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, and he's worked with... Uh, England sevens, women's England sevens, Chelsea, West Ham. Like he is a very, very experienced S and C coach mm. and an incredible hype man. <laughs> incredible hype man. So, he's a better hype man than S and C coach, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> no, he uh, he's brilliant, and and you know that that just shows you have to make sure the environment's right for for these kind of like mm. maximal attempts, and that's just you know arousal levels and you know. Uh, where do you see people going wrong uh, when trying to develop as much strength as possible? So I'll narrow this down eventually towards the bench press. But what do you see are the common problems that people make where they're, like, they're trying to get as strong as possible and they're not really achieving their full potential? The common thing is too heavy too often. You know, there's only so many times you can go to those sort of 90% plus weights uh, with, with appreciable volume. I think you can touch on it quite regularly. But if you're doing sessions where you're thinking that you're going to do rep maxes with 90% plus and then keep doing that week after week after week and, and recover in time. And, you know, so basically once the bar speed slows down beyond that kind of, you know, the, the VBT type uh, bandwidths, not that, not that I use mm-hmm. them particularly, but if you're working at like 0.1 meters per second and you're actually grinding out lift after lift week after week, you're not going to, you're not going to improve. The, the cost is too great mm. for you to improve. Um, the other thing, I think, and this is on the flip, so going too heavy too often is obviously the sort of, sort of a short-term way to fall off a cliff. Uh, a long-term way to do it is to not appreciate what you need to do here to get what you need over here. Sorry, run mm-hmm. out of space on my camera. So that kind of, <laughs> that kind of block of work that gives you... and It's more like... Um, I really like the terminology of... Um, of the sprint work when they talk about sort of inoculation. So inoculation for speed inoculation for your hamstring. So you, you run fast mm-hmm. and then you prepare the hamstrings uh, in a specific way to sprint in, in field sports. So if you do sprint, the likelihood of injury is reduced because you've exposed yourself to it. It's the same, same kind of principle, but more from a, a stress inoculation. So you do lots of volume and lots of, you work on lots of different muscle groups in isolation down here. So you can deal with the, the, the amount of stress is greater, although it's not on the higher end of the intensity spectrum, 
So you're great, a greater amount of stress here. And then that allows you, as you move through through your intensity, so you move through to the next phase and you obviously increase the intensity, volume mm -hmm. either stays the same or, or reduces slightly. And when you do that, then you, you can deal with that stress. You've actually, in, in a general sense, you've inoculated yourself against stress because you do this mm -hmm. big volume of work. But the, the, on the lower end, it's much more, it's much easier to keep progressing with the lower intensities and to keep putting a little bit more on and do lots of volume or complete lots of volume. Um, and, then, and then you can take the next step and you can take the step after that, which then sees you sort of realise all that, all that work and then hopefully get a, a, some sort of personal best. Mm -hmm. So is that increase or accumulation of volume with the sort of sub-maximal intensities, uh, does that involve still with bench press or have you increased the variability of exercises to expose the body to, I guess, force and loading in different ways, which kind of widens the base yeah. for it's, its, it's your, tolerance for... Yeah, it's your bandwidth, isn't it? For force. Yeah, yeah. Mm. so you can produce, you, you get, you know, Fred Hatfield put it in a, in a nice way before with the squat, the, the, you, you get this sort of like total, with, with the squat you'd use lots of variations so you get total leg development. And it's the same kind of principle. You get total development of all the muscles required to enhance your, in this case, bench press performance. Um, and uh, but on on the on the so yeah, you, you, on that isolated muscle side, you get this kind of every single muscle gets developed to its maximal ability or its maximal potential there in isolation. Then you start to strip away, don't you? You strip away all of that work, and it becomes more hyper focused on the competition exercise as you get closer to the end. And but the the bench press itself, the competition style bench press, will not give you everything that you need to have a good bench press. Yeah, um, and you that doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, just when you at some point you'll have you'll have a failure point, won't you? So what is your failure mm -hmm. point, and what was what was the muscle group that that essentially let you down, or the technical factor that let you down? So on this on this lower end as well, you'd also work on you know technical variations of the competition lift. So do you have, mm -hmm. do you have that sort of strength skill that you can perform the lift, uh, the competition lift in a number of ways. You can pause at a number of mm -hmm. different spots. You can, um, you can set up in different, in a different manner. So you could have your feet up and perform the bench press, but in the competition style or you could, you know, you could, um, pause halfway down, down and up. You could pause, have two pauses halfway down on the chest up you can have three you know all these small things that really challenge the execution of the skill mm -hmm. that shows that that pre-period before going to that bit where you're hyper focused on the bench press that must involve quite a long length of time mm. because if you're doing a number of different variations and you need to expose yourself to that over several weeks so you have enough time to practice those different variations like doing it once won't necessarily have the effect that I think you'd want. So surely that would have to be quite a long period of time. Like if you're training for like a particular competition, have you got quite a long, let's call it just an off season just for the, yeah. or GPP just for ease. Is that quite a long period? And that hyper-focused bench press period is really quite short in comparison because you are exposing yourself to different variations. You are trying to push yourself with the volume there uh, and just giving you time to, practice the skill in different ways uh yeah it, it would be one of the long it would be the longest phase of all the phases um but within that so th one of the key things for me within all of this you have so if you were to use like some common language with um sort of periodized planning so you've got uh, just, just for argument's sake we we'll say accumulation intensification realization that kind of like bond to chuck um uh periodized kind of language um, or for the block periodization anyway. So um, if we use that within that, you have, if you zoom right out, you have that, don't you? You have this block of like what you say is accumulation, then your block of intensification, then your realization block at the end. But within each accumulation block, you have periods of intensification and probably realization, but it would be get, get rebranded as a, a deload, wouldn't it, at this point? Mm. So you, you have all those things and they, you cycle through them all the time within a larger block of work, which would be classed as accumulation, which is just the overall focus, but within that. So you're always touching on heavier weights and you're, 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 
you know, and then when it comes down to more of a micro level, the, the frequency, or what, what's the optimal frequency to get improvements? Now, I know uh, the Owen Hubbard, the world record bench presser, uh, um, 83 um, kilos, he, he benches like five times a week, six times a week. But to be able to do that, he's that's a lot of bench. That's a lot of bench press. Yeah, it turns out he's quite good at it. Um, <laughs> uh, he, you know, is that is that right for everyone? Probably not. You know, he's he's at the elite end. He's uh, you know he's he's mastered he's mastered the dose and frequency for himself. So he can he can obviously tolerate that. Most people can probably tolerate about twice, maybe three times a week before they start to break down. And that's just to do with the, what we spoke mm. about earlier. Just to do with the recovery. Can you recover in time? What accessory mm. ex- so for you to get the the payoff at the back end at the front end what kind of exercise do you have to do how much work do you have to do on those exercises and then what's the resultant cost of that because every single thing you do comes with a cost even if it's going for a walk so <laughs> you know even on the lowest end that comes at some sort of physiological cost although small so you have to you have to weigh up what exercise are you putting in? Why are you putting them in? You obviously want, on a basic level, this accumulation phase is total development, isn't it? It's um, total development of the skill and total development of the, of the individual muscle groups that go into giving you a top bench press. Now, as you go through the cycle a few times and you get to the back end, you're going to have, you're going to fail, like everyone fails at some point, and, you, and then you have to go and assess why you failed. What was the actual root cause of that? That failure. What was, was there a particular point in the lift where you could not produce the correct level of force to complete the lift, or is it something as simple as I just don't have enough muscle mass? Mm-hmm. Full stop. To to actually be a successful bench presser, where, where do you fail and why do you fail? Um, are things you have to consider, and and the whole point probably is to you know you're pushing yourself right to the limit of what you can do. So you will probably fail every now and again, and then you have to assess that. But you also have to look at um, sub those those lifts that are uh, literally limit 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 bench presses. Say that you can clearly see where the sticking point is and where the failure point was, and then you can take that and you can work that background and work on those things. Mm-hmm. It sounds like failure is necessary because if you slowly improve, very gradually i guess mm. while that's quite important when you look out and view everything um you need to have an understanding of where the limitations are or your limiters are yeah and without pushing yourself at that to that level with some sort of frequency you're never really going to know like like you said about muscle mass like how do you how do you know if someone needs more muscle mass to improve their sort of powerlifting performance what kind of failure would happen which which make you think like actually uh we need to improve this probably a bit a little bit more muscle mass that might help as well like what's the kind of process for identifying where people need to improve well with the with the muscle mass point it's probably more to do with when you when you look at the athlete and you look at their their height and their leverages so look at their height and leverages and then you see they fail and you're like well okay if they they basically need to improve their leverages more so they just need more mm. muscle mass, full stop. To and it'll probably be quite obvious with the the total amount of weight that they can lift relative to their height. So um, you, you're going to see that pretty early on. The other stuff is more technical, as in they fail at the chest, they fail at the midpoint, they fail, you know, a, a number of places they could they could fail on the way down and the way up. Um, mm-hmm. And and then you're looking at the more of the technical stuff and the specific muscle groups that were, that are lacking in strength. How often do you bench press a week? If we compare you to Owen, uh, twice I do. I do two, but I, I would do again. That's more a, a, a one point to probably bring up is this whole sort of shift in how you train based on your uh, lifestyle and your your circ- life circumstances. So for me, twice is probably the max I can I can realistically do. Um, mm-hmm. it, but then I try and do I cover quite a lot of volume in those. Uh, in those sessions so I, i'm pretty sore and how, how long do they last um well again in lifestyle i would like them to last longer because i'd like to rest longer in between but i try and keep them to a, yeah. maybe an hour hour and 10 minutes um mm-hmm. but if i had my way it'd be two hours <laughs> <laughs> 
the glory days uh, <laughs> the glory. <laughs> where you could yeah. train for as long as you wanted yeah, yeah, back yeah. in the yeah. uh, well, that I, dungeon gym at St Mary's. If I had one piece of advice for um, any young lifter is to take full advantage of, of, of that period of time and don't take it for granted. Don't waste that opportunity. Um, but it, it comes with... You know, it's like the uh, it comes with the experience, doesn't it? You you realise what mm. you don't have once you've lost it. Um, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you know, God, if you if I knew everything I knew now, and I had that amount of time. Mm. Yeah, I often reflect that. Oh, I wish I'd known that now. Like, or yeah. you reached like twenty eight. I was like, oh, if I'd known that back in the day, or if I'd known what I know now when I was like eighteen, it would be a different story. My career path could have gone a little bit different maybe I even could have been a professional athlete but uh you know I'm one of those sort of failed athletes uh those who can't teach <laughs> <laughs> situations and it's always interesting to look back and think yeah why did I do that like you said earlier why did I do that but you know full well that when you did it back in the day like seven eight years ago you probably thought to yourself yeah I know exactly what I'm doing I know exactly what I'm doing here and then you look back and like Really? Yeah. Well, you get you really? get a bit sidetracked as well with because uh, you're because you're learning the you know if you're interested in strength and conditioning science and training generally, you like to try lots of different things. Mm. So I remember, yeah, I don't know how old I was. I, I was maybe training for powerlifting, but I got caught up in doing a power curl competition on a random uh, a random Friday afternoon. So who can lift? Who can curl the most weight? But I'm actually like competing in a sport at the time. It's like what, what are you what are you doing? I can see the transfer. Don't uh, worry. Yeah, it's muscle a, mass, a direct transfer. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't win, <laughs> which is just twice as bad. Um, but yeah, 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 it would be great to go back and and. But then maybe you need it as well because you need to have experienced all of that stuff to get to the end point where you're like, oh, now I know. Um, but yeah, there we go. We can reflect on that a lot. What we could have been. Yeah, well, when reflecting on your powerlifting career, because you're still competing, so. What changes have you made throughout the years that have sharpened your process to become a, a, a better powerlifter? So I, I started uh, I started powerlifting when I went to came to university, but I started a little bit late at university. So I was twenty one, turning twenty two, and I met a guy called Nick Reese who was a powerlifter there. And I've always been interested in strength training, um, but I never really knew. I never really had access to anyone who did it. So you go to like your sort of commercial gyms, wouldn't you? And people are just sort of, mm -hmm. you know, pretending to be bodybuilders and, and sort of trade. But then you've got the sort of local... Uh, vest and gloves. Yeah, vest and gloves. Perfect. Little skinny uh, York lifting belt um, for curls. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, they're the kind of guys you look to for knowledge who, are, who clearly have none. Um, and then... I met Nick. Nick was a powerlifter. His dad was a powerlifter before him, uh, ran competitions. And then um, I got into it that way. So I got into it a little bit late. And then obviously got the bug straight away. I, did, I didn't want to do a competition. I was actually, I, I don't really like um, the thought of standing in front of people doing anything. Um, and then uh, I did the competition. I was sort of hooked, but I was hooked on the process. Like as soon as you do it, you start, your mind starts going, oh, how do I make that slightly better? How do I get slightly better? It wasn't because I don't, I don't. I did definitely didn't win. I didn't place anywhere. Um, they shouldn't have let me lift a bit. I imagine now with the uh, you know the sport has grown massively in its profile recently. And uh, I did a local competition, had no no equipment, no kit, no belt, no nothing. I and they let me lift in a pair of uh, Canterbury rugby shorts and a cut off t shirt. And and a pair, I was wearing a pair of like Mizuno trainers and stuff. I look like right right mess. And were, Mizuno. I remember one guy saying one of the one of the referees there was like he can't, you know, he hasn't got any equipment. He isn't wearing the right equipment. And Paul, fair play to him, said don't worry about it, just let him lift. And then I lifted. Then I was hooked from there. Um, mm -hmm. But then the, the, the did you win? No, no, no. I don't think so. I don't. I don't think they'd give the give give me a total for what I was wearing. I can't remember. I don't think I won. <laughs> I, I've no idea. I've no idea what I lifted actually when I look back on it but um but yeah the, I had some it did its job though didn't it that competition it did its job because well, you were it, hooked and then yeah 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 wanted to come back and compete yeah yeah I enjoyed I enjoyed I didn't necessarily enjoy competing I enjoyed the because the competing for me is is a bit of a it's a mixed bag I love I love all the training up to the point of the competition I absolutely dread the competition 
<laughs> when I'm in the middle of it, I'm sort of talking to myself the whole time that you don't need to do it. Like, you don't need to do it. You've got nothing to prove to anyone anymore. You know, you don't need to lift. Um, what are you doing? Just go home. <laughs> Say that through the whole day. <laughs> finish as soon as I finish I'm like I can't wait for the next one and then I can't and I start thinking about all the things that didn't go right and then how I can how I can uh, change those the next time round and then I just start the process again Um, but uh, yeah so the the one moment that was one moment in in the career obviously got me hooked on the the sport and the the process Uh, the second thing I'd done I was quite lucky I suppose because the sport is um uh the sport is is much bigger now and the, the the level of competition and the level of strength that the lifters display now is is phenomenal so i was very lucky that i sort of entered the sport and it was maybe a bit of a low ebb in terms of just numbers compete number of people competing and the talent pool was was smaller so i managed to sort of work my way up to to getting invited to a um an international quite early so i think i came second at the british championships after two years i think two years mm. and then got invited to it's the Western European Cup is like the sort of second tier international competition. So I went there um, and then my sort of second moment there was, right, okay, I've lifted, I've come second there, so I've got a silver medal there. And then I, I, I sort of wanted to go down this route of improving my technical ability with the lifts because I was strong, but I was like, I knew I was technically very poor still. Um, so I shifted shifted my focus more towards developing the technical aspects of my lift, of my lifting, sorry. Um, and then that evolved into sort of a, more of a process on how you, because, you know, like skill acquisition, there probably wouldn't be a great deal of work on skill acquisition in, in powerlifting because it's always viewed as quite a, uh, it's a, it's viewed as a very, all the skills are viewed as very easy, aren't they? You talk to anyone mm-hmm. and say, oh, what's a squat? And they're like, they don't talk about it like it's a technically uh, demanding lift, bench press, not technically demanding, deadlift, not, then they all are very technically demanding, not as much as other sports, but they still have a technical aspect to them that is, is, that needs to be mastered. Um, and, and you can, with the skill act stuff, it's like, you can look on both ends. You can look down the, the end where you do, well, te- what's technique work? If I was to ask you what technique work is, what percentage is technique work, um, performed at? Well, I think, Oh, well, I guess my philosophy that technique work needs to be across a large spectrum of damn, <laughs> weight. Damn you. Because if you damn think, you. You're, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's it, isn't it? So As soon as you increase the, increase the intensity, the skill changes. Exactly, So you yeah. then got to practice the skill with that. Yeah, and then, then you've got that. I should have answered 70%. Yeah, well, that I was seems hoping to be you were going to say like 50%, to and I'd be like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah, so that, that full spectrum of lit, so you, the, the skill is expressed over the full spectrum, mm. isn't it? It's very easy. It's very easy to express perfect skill skill execution at fifty uh, percent. It gets increasingly harder as the intensity goes up. So I tried to I had a sort of moment after that where I tried to develop some ideas and thoughts around how you use and and whether this you know I only say this because Dan Clever would would not be happy with me talking about constraints the way I'm going to talk about constraints. So don't show him this video. But you use like a constraints philosophy. To, and, and it's very much based on, you know, you look at the West Side stuff and you look at, um, there's obviously a physiological aspect to, to using bands, chains, pauses, mm. all that kind of stuff. There's obviously, a, there is a physiological part of that. You're, you're changing the, the, the function, the neuromuscular function of the muscle, but it also is incredibly useful at certain percentages to, to challenge the skill of the lift. So how, how, can you, yeah. how can you challenge the skill? And I'm not talking about hanging weights off you know, elastic bands and everything's bouncing around. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about actually uh, a very high intensity version of the lift with these constraints added on. So whether that's chains or bands or pauses, um, even even on the very, very top end, you know, like uh, I've been playing around with the uh, weight releases recently um, for the eccentric overload. But you look at that and, okay, how, how challenging that is as a... And, and you talk about different components of the lift. So I've used them for the bench press, but also for the... Um, for the squat, but you look at the squat, you're like, oh, what's, what's one of the most demanding parts of the squat when you wear equipment is the walkout. So when you stand up and walk out with the weight, because you shift from one leg to the other, and you've got this this sort of super maximal load on your back in the equipment, <laughs> and then uh, you, you add the weight releases in, and that's almost like a heightened version of what, what that feels like. 
They have to work so hard to stabilise and, and find these kind of perfect positions under duress. Um, and then obviously the squat is demanding because but luckily it gets easier because they fall off. Um, but yeah, like that, then that, that was one aspect. So that, that was quite early on. I sort of started thinking down that route how I, how I enhance my uh, skill execution with the lifts and my technique. And, and I'm still, mm. you know, that's like an ongoing journey. I don't think you ever really, um, ever really sort of perfect that because it takes c- constant work. Lastly, the sort of last, the, so then that sort of, then I looked at things around structure of structure of training, structure of, you know, the how many weeks do you want to be lifting heavy? What do you want to, how do you want to sequence your week to get the maximum, you know, the maximum kind of return on the training, you know, stimulus versus recovery. I sort of went down a bit of a rabbit hole there. And, and again, none of this stuff is, is 100% right. But it's just having a, like we spoke about before, it's having a process, isn't it? That you can, you can refer back to the process and go, well, am I, am I staying true to these? Because I've thought long and hard about the process. Am I actually staying true to what the process is? Because if I'm not, then that's got to always be your first point of, port of call is to go back to that and go, right, okay, let's be true to the process and apply that to the training rather than mm-hmm. sort of getting lost in the training and trying to change stuff all the, all the time on the fly. Um, but my final evolution as a lifter is post obviously married got children now i'm now i'll be 41 by the end of the week um so i'm now oh, officially happy birthday well yeah not anymore they're, they're de- depressing affairs um <laughs> just birthday yeah just <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so you know i'm like officially a master's lifter now properly um and, and i've got okay. three kids and you know how do you how do you then adjust training around that it's not it's not a case of Oh yeah, I'll, I'll maybe knock off work a little early today so I can get to the gym and spend two and a half hours there. You know, it's it's uh, very much. Uh, I've got one hour after the kids go to bed at seven thirty to get some heavy training done, which is a completely novel experience to uh, read bed t- like bath routine, bedtime stories, <laughs> then go in and then you're like, right, okay, let's you know switch it on and get yeah. into it. Good night, moon, and then half an hour later you're benching heavy. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that that's been that's been different. But again, it's just they're the challenges, aren't they? Um, so you know, I'm referring about other lifters. The, the, so I stopped lifting when I had the first uh, when we had um, our first um, little girl. Um, I stopped lifting. I said I'll take a bit of a break because I want to, you know, I want to be around more and and uh, not be sort of letting training sort of dictate things. And um, and then. I was like, oh, no, sorry, I thought I couldn't do it. I thought there's no way I can do this with a kid and the job's demanding. Now I have a, you know, have a kid and uh, it's going to be much harder. And then uh, I spoke to a guy, I know Tony Cliff, and he's now two-time world champion, classic. He's won loads of, loads of stuff. He's the best lifter in the country. Um, and I was like, mate, how do you, you've got three kids now. How do, you, how do you do this? He goes, well, I just put them to bed and then I go and train. And he was just really like matter of fact. But I was like, all <laughs> oh, right. Um, <laughs> so the, my excuse of not having the time anymore is gone. Mm-hmm. So um, built the gym, yeah. built the gym in the garden, and then uh, and then uh, yeah, that's been me for the last sort of two years. But then it does work because I, nice. you know, I managed to I managed to break the, the um, total record at ninety three, the the squat record at ninety three using a process like that. And I think as you go mm. through your your, your sort of years of, of competing and training, you, you know, I don't have to worry about some of the stuff I used to worry about before. You know, I know exactly how I need to warm up. I know the process of training. I know when to back off more from a, um, you know, a, a kind of auto-regulatory kind of, you know, mm. I know. So the process now of training is very much like if, if, if I don't feel like I'm going to produce the right amount of work, the right kind of work, I just take the day, take the day. So, you, you know, we were talking about the sort of like, Zoom, zooming out, zooming in, macro, micro kind of planning. Now it's very much like I view the training as a block of work for a month. And I have to complete X number of sessions in a month rather than thinking I have to have this sort of, I'm on this seven day cycle. I'm on a 30 day, 30 for, for argument's sake, a 30 day cycle of training. And I have to fit in the pieces over the 30 days rather than rather than being like, right, okay, I, every day, Monday is always bench press day, and so is mm. Thursday. They're my bench press days. They don't, you know, they don't shift. I'll, I'm always going to bench after a day off each time because I want to be freshest for bench press, and I want bench press to, you know, to be my lift, and I'm going to push it on. Now it's like, right, okay, if I, if I have to do 
squat, bench press, deadlift three days in a row because I've not been able to do it because of other commitments there, then I just lump them all together and I do it. And I understand that that's not going to be, um, they're probably not going to be, they're going to be hard because I'm going to accumulate more fatigue over the three days. And I'm not going to, I'm probably going to hit the numbers. They're not going to feel as clean as they should. Um, again, due to sort of under recovery, but I am getting the work done still. In terms of bench press, I guess more looking at the skill, what common mistakes do you think people make? As in, is it their positioning is often quite bad? Uh, I know we talked about limiters, but uh, just to kind of, we've talked about powerlifting and structuring it around lifestyle and how we can actually focus on developing the skill and programming. But if we go directly to, to bench press, what key things do people need to really focus on to improve their bench press if, from like a powerlifting point of view? So I guess, yeah, the, rather than just, you know, you're doing a sort of upper body pushing exercise, how do you get better at the skill of competing at bench press and powerlifting? So I think the first thing starts with the, the position you have to get your body in to reduce the, the, the stroke of the bench press. So you want the bar to move as through a shorter distance as possible. And that's probably the key to all the powerless in the end is that you're trying to move that bar with whatever technique you can, can use the, the shortest distance possible for the bench press. You can sort of hyper, um, hyper exaggerate that through, through a number of different, different ways. But the, the, so what do you need to start with? So I, I think people neglect genuine flexibility and mobility and they don't, it doesn't become a, doesn't become a particularly big factor in in their thinking around the bench press where for me I think it's the difference I would see in my own training from working so trying to increase uh, or decrease tone in the kind of anterior so you want to get this arched position don't you so you imagine that's your your lower back you you want this big arch where your lower back is and then you sort of connect to the floor feet flat so your feet have to be flat um, shoulders, head in contact with the bench, obviously wide uh, competition width kind of grip. You want to have good length through your anterior chain. You want to have loads and loads of thoracic extension. Um, and you also want to have loads and loads of internal rotation through the shoulder. And if you can cover those th three things off before you bench press, you'll probably bench press pretty well. Um, in terms of the, te the a technical model, um, what do I see people doing technically? They don't they don't try hard enough to get in these positions because they're not comfortable. Um, they're not comfortable. They're not they're not. You know, the very you, you only have to model it off the very best bench. But the people who lift the most, bar a couple, will all will all adopt a very similar set up and position and people sort of attempt it you see them sort of attempt it because I, I would be new to this kind of instagram thing because i wasn't wasn't signed up to instagram till till uh, august so i've been watching <laughs> been watching a lot more people bench press recently but no people just don't try hard enough to get in the positions they're really not um they're really not focusing on that uh, as much as they should mm. foot position so feet feet need to be further back and flat but even then you look at you you start you start doing something like you've got to look at ankle mobility then after that and hip internal rotation. So the, the reason you can't get your feet back and flat is because you can't get your knee over your toe, so you don't have enough dorsiflexion and you don't have enough hip internal rotation to pull them right back and have your hips wide. So you set this nice sort of solid base in connection with the floor. Um, I, I think that... Yeah, that'd be the main things I think that I see currently that I see. And don't get me wrong, some of these people are phenomenally strong, but who, who don't do it. But the people who look like they shouldn't bench a lot, but do bench a lot, do the same things. So the, you, you, you can always see someone, you can probably spot a sort of 180 to 200 kilo bench presser by looking at them, you know, tons of muscle mass in all the right areas, which is really good, like, which mm. is really, really important. But should they not be a 220 bench presser? <laughs> because yeah. technically they're not they're not proficient enough but it, it's kind of shifting the mindset isn't it of what's actually good and what's um what's you know what, what's the actual lim what are the limiting factors to you uh pushing the you know pushing the boundaries of your of your force expression mm. 
Well, you've provided that really, really nice framework. Like you've listed particular joint motions that people are lacking, which is then limiting them getting into the right positions. Mm. And then you provide a good argument uh, showing that, you know, you're only ever going to be as strong as your ability to produce that force and position is such a large important factor for that yeah. it isn't always about just how you progressively load through programming you know your programming should involve focusing on the skill of movement because obviously f how you apply force and the direction of that force is important mm. so if you haven't got the right position you're not going to be able to direct it in the right way then you are therefore limited yeah so I think you provide a really, really nice framework that people can go away and like, oh, okay, what's my hip internal rotation like? What's my shoulder internal rotation like? And actually reflect on like, oh, maybe this could be limiting my ability to bench press. Um, to finish off, tell me about 949 strength because if anyone wants to learn about getting better at the bench press, <laughs> surely they can uh, come to you. Uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Um, so nine for nine was a, a business I started after the administration. So after London Irish went into administration, I had to think about what, basically what I wanted to do as a, you know, as a, as a sort of career. And I've, you know, uh, powerlifting is a amateur sport. So all the, all the roles within powerlifting, lifters don't really get paid uh, all the all the people who help out behind the scenes to make the sport function don't get paid. There isn't any money in the sport, mm. so that as a job in itself, working for say British powerlifting, isn't isn't necessarily a, an avenue you could go down. But I love coaching. I've always had a passion for powerlifting, and I feel like like we've spoken about earlier. I, I feel that um, my experience of working in a professional sport is of benefit to people who want to get better at. at powerlifting because I could you know I understand both both sides of the coin really like so I understand powerlifting I understand mm. sort of this kind of holistic approach to to developing athletically developing for 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 sports so the the aim was to to start something that can um can push the sport forwards and and can help athletes achieve what they want to achieve with powerlifters so mm. I've always wanted to I've always wanted to um to pursue this kind of like, you know, I say online, it's not an online business. It's like, it's basically coaching. I always wanted to coach powerlifters. That's sort of my dream goal for, mm. you know, I was like, when I, when I turn 50, maybe powerlifting will be of a level in terms of financially stable enough that there might be a job there. And, you know, would I have positioned myself mm. to be one of those people who could help out? Um, I don't know mm. if it'll ever, I hope it does. I don't know if it ever will get to that point, but yeah, the, it just came out as, you know, there's the opportunity, wasn't it? So, I don't. I, mm. I didn't. I got made redundant. I didn't have a job, and then I got the opportunity to to do something that, without the redundancy, I would never have even. I wouldn't have done it because mm. you get so. You wouldn't have thought about it. No, no, because you get so invested in what you do there and then. So fully invested in the sort of London Irish project, and now I'm fully invested mm. in nine for nine, uh, nine for nine strength, trying to help people on their powerlifting journey, and I, and I truly, I truly believe that that that. What we do is is n novel in terms of. I, I think there's there's definitely information here within nine for nine strength that is not not common, not sort of common practice within within powerlifting. That's what I that's what I believe. So how can people get in contact if they want to come and train with you, be coached by you, uh, anything like that? Through the website www.9for9strength.com, um, we've got a full list of services there. Um, looking to film uh you know it'd be free like a free master class on powerlifting or this method um which will film in the next couple of weeks and hopefully start a youtube channel that will uh have uh some of the information on there have the master class and then a whole a whole sort of series of videos elaborating on the processes um and so th the aim is to try and educate as much as possible and then and then hopefully people see value in that. Oh, brilliant. And uh, this episode might go out at a similar time. So good, yeah. uh, hopefully that'll be really cool because yeah. uh, as soon as people can listen to this podcast and go straight to your YouTube channel and vice versa. Yeah, amazing. So, no, that's really cool. No, I'm really excited. I'm really hoping that it will pay off. I don't see why it couldn't head in that direction regarding powerlifting, you know, forming stable employment around it and being having money in powerlifting because I'm 
starting to see it in a number of other sports that were all amateur and now all of a sudden the, the professional side comes yeah. in. More people get involved with health and fitness. So whenever that happens, more money follows. Uh, and the professional side is what looks good and it's what's going to draw people in. So I think powerlifting will get there and it'll be cool to see nine for nine right there at the head leading the way. So <laughs> no, it was really cool to see you. Yeah, same, same. Thanks, Phil.